I now invite Harry Burke, Roja Farkas, and Julieta Aranda to come back here in front so we can have the panel discussion. And it's great because we are very much in time. We're even become more Swiss than the Swiss, 10 minutes in advance. So we have a lot of time for the discussion, which is very good because this morning it was a bit frustrating. I'm sure you had some more questions in the audience and you couldn't ask them. So, where is it? Yeah, we're going to use the, the mobile microphones. I think it's better. Elise, do you want to start? So maybe again, I'm going to start with a question that tries to connect uh, what we've just uh, listened to. And um, to me, it seems that we, in every presentation, we were looking at alternatives or something that is not part of uh, some mainstream or at least trying to resist a format that, in your case, Julieta, for example, as you said, became too academic for the mission you gave yourself in the beginning with Eflux. Uh, in the case of Harry, people following Gomringer's legacy as a way to, I guess, escape traditional poetry that has very strong canons as well. Although he also entered, um, I guess, history. Um, and in your case, Roja, you know, you know, trying to explore alternatives um, into publishing, uh, considering that language is evolving and how artists actually um, you know, finding new ways, I'm not sure if they knew, but you know, ways to actually publish their work and, and discuss ideas. So, um, I guess my, my first question, maybe we can start with, with Julieta, um, is connected to that. Like, do you, you, I think super community reflects that because I, I agree that the format is much freer than, than Eflux indeed, but do you, do you feel you you managed to, to address all those issues that you were mentioning that you didn't kind of, or the format that you didn't manage to, to follow with Eflux? I, I mean, you said at some point that they were complementary, and I was wondering if you could um, expand on that or if you feel that my comment on being, you know, resistant to a certain format is accurate and, yeah. I mean, in, in this particular case, I don't know if resistance would be the correct thing because it would be like resisting myself, and um, that's uh, and not entirely the case. It was. It's more when, when something, uh, you know, like like the analogies, like I don't know, like I guess, uh, uh, <coughs> like you have a child and you want it to become an artist, but it wants to be a lawyer, yeah, or something like that, or you want it to be a lawyer, but instead it becomes an artist, and you have to just let it be and and do another thing. I mean, like, I, I find, I find that, like, at some point, um, the project became uh, successful to a point that we didn't anticipate. Uh, I mean, like, this happened with just about everything we did with Eflux. We did not think that it was going to be uh, 10 years long, yeah? Like, we started something thinking maybe we will do three um, issues. And then the next thing you know is you have been making a monthly magazine for 10 years. And it's like, okay, this is, uh, you know, you see it and, and, and then is when you look at it and it's like, okay, so what happened in these 10 years? And is it still doing what we wanted to do? Um, and uh, I mean, like, it's great that it's still there, but a lot of the things that, um, that we wanted uh, as Anton and myself then have to accommodate the, agenda and the desires and the writing curiosity of all the people that contribute to this project. So it's not anymore just two people trying to figure out how to do something, which super community, at least at this moment, gives us the chance to do. I mean, like, with, because with the journal at some point, it also, people, I mean, you were talking about that uh, uh, at some point, like what happens with print, yeah? Like people started, to, started wanting books, and then we became a book publisher. And we have to deal with making books, and that's something that I never in my life thought I wanted to do. And it becomes this animal that then you are um, farming, let's say, and, and, and taming. And but it's it's a different. I mean, like it's not the freedom that now we regained with uh, with this new project. So. 
if that answers the question. Sorry, my first question maybe was not it was not super clear. I was uh, I wasn't also sure about the the question, but because you know I was trying to connect the the three, the three contributions. And I mean, do you agree that is I mean if is that still possible to resist a format? Because I mean, you said maybe resistant is not the right word, but still I think we here looking at alternatives, something that's different. Um, and then it brings to mind notions such as being efficient. I mean. What about the audience? Because you, you said, Julieta, your agenda was ac actually devised according to your needs as, as artists with Anton and, and yourself when back when you started Eflux. Um, but what about the audience? You know, how, you know, I think I, I'm interested in this also relationship. How do you anticipate what your audience is going to be like and how do you, you know, react to that? And why, why would you need to find new formats okay. if, you know, wh how do you consider the audience within this, I, g I guess, dynamic? Yeah. Um, so in regards, in regards to like, if you're able to um, find alternative formats, I guess that was what I was trying to say is that, um, of course you can, you just need to be very wary of how those are so instantly subsumed or co-opted. Um, and I guess that was kind of, my point and and in terms of like alternative formats what was interesting in terms of my trajectory with publishing which like you said there's suddenly a demand for books but was that I, when we started doing the publications we started with online as well like print and online started at the same time and there was this idea somehow that well it wasn't online it was a kind of download but there was this idea that that would b somehow uh, be m more accessible you know it was kind of like a 90s like you know, fetishizing the idea of like the internet as but somehow being like this this open space of access. But you know, actually, what you find is that it, it's not like the things that are coming up in your feed are predicated on w like what you're searching for, who your friends are, like what country you're in, what kind of internet you have, all of those things. Um, and so, what was interesting is that what became alternative was seeing how the kind of, yeah, these ty types of languages that are influenced by this kind of immediacy or this like instant self-publishing on social networking, how that kind of had changed like the artistic language. So there's something I guess of like online language, but it's inherent in the kind of the written form of these printed books and the, the yeah, that people wanted the objects. And, and actually that, I don't think, that I don't kind of frown on that like, oh, people wanting books, you know, I love having books. It's more actually that it became, a, a much a much uh, more uh, a kind of like explicit like locator of the community that surrounds Arcadia Missa, which is a fairly small one, and it and it is something that you know it you know the, uh, the print runs are so small, and, and and actually most of the people that are getting them we're in some way in dialogue with, even if they're ordering them from Australia or from America or, or from you know from France, and and and, and so it was really interesting because it was like what what when we had the website how to sleep faster the stats of like where people were looking at it from is exactly the same of where people were ordering our print publications from you know so it's like it's the same network um and that actually that it kind of gave that sense of community um and so yeah that 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 in a way it was like alternative to go to print you know whereas at the start we were like oh my god look how clever we are doing you know like a curated digital space isn't this amazing like you know we are you know using video text and image blah, blah, blah. and then actually what we're doing is we're printing in black and white and they're books yeah it's paper and it works so yeah okay um harry maybe i have a question for you uh what struck me when you compared uh, Gomringa's poetry and the uh, more, uh, I mean, contemporary uh, digital ways of uh, reinventing poetry is the, is the importance, of course, of, of the visual aspect. And uh, that can be seen both as only for the visual aspect and also if you want uh, to go further in the poetry, you have, to, you have to make it yourself because you're choosing what you're going to read and which way you're going to read. It's very obvious with uh, Gomringa, but also nowadays with most of the examples that you showed us when there's a stream and lots of words, you choose the ones you want to keep and you, you, you construct 
uh, your own poetry. So, well, it's not really a question, but it, I was struck by that, and I was wondering whether you, you have something to say about that. Um. <coughs> I, f I feel uh, like it was short. I feel like it was ne negligence on my part not to present any types of poetry that aren't visual because obviously vision is just one type of hierarchy and you don't need vision to read. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily need vision to read. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, but I don't know much about um, tactile forms of poetry or um, obviously the performance at the end you didn't need to see it was sound poetry um, so yeah I'm I'm not yeah I, I feel um, I don't know what to say <laughs> um, I feel bad I feel bad now no, pl please don't. Um, but I, I'm, I'm wondering, it's like I, I couldn't help but think or relate uh, what you presented with um, site-specific art, but as understood in the 70s, that you know you need the reader to complete the, the work. And without its specific context, in this case, the screen and, um, and well, this visual constellation, if we just um, limit ourselves to this, you know, visual complex, completion of, of the work um, and uh, I think I forgot what I wanted to say but anyway I, s I saw a parallel with that I mean I, I don't know if you agree that you, you actually you know you need the the person who is behind the screen to complete the work which is already the case with Gomringer as you said you know you have many ways to read the same po poem and actually yourself and your background and your you know very personal being is gonna have an influence on you know, each experience of the same work, right? And in that sense, it's reader-specific, but also, well, site-specific, if I, if I may borrow this, this historic term. I don't know if you, if you agree with that, or if, if that helps you formulate an answer, or I don't know. Yeah, just that um, reading a poem is always a collaboration, or writing a poem is always a collaboration between yourself as the poet, the author of the poem, and the reader who, of course, can bring their own experience, their own um, associations to it, but I would also go to as far to say as, or, or I think what I was trying to bring in today was that that's also you're also collaborating with the technology of the page or the technology of the screen or the technology of uh, the sound, um, and there's like non-human actors, there's obviously non-human readers of poetry um, in terms of people experimenting with um, bots and um, taking up for example, the certain keywords out of Twitter streams and formulating poems out of that. So, so, I, so I think it, the, the the point is that writing is is a very collaborative process. It's not just a, a stream, a single stream of thoughts that's then perceived as complete, but it's it's informed by the reader and they they they're, they're active sort of co co-author in a sense, and but it's also informed by these other active co-authors, which are the the, the the objects and the, the technologies. And, and so, I guess, to bring them back to the first question, my, my point was that it was less, less in terms of like sticking alternatives, it's just trying to be specific about the, the players that are, that are involved and, and what spe specific technology we brings, be it the page or be it um, a Kindle or be it like a sand or like the universe. You know? Yeah. Yeah, then this is just uh, for you because there is something that um, I, I like quite a bit about uh, the formal aspects of, uh, you know, like the, the investigation that goes into the <coughs> technologies from either the, from the printing press to the illuminated manuscript to the uh, emoji to whatever it is that it takes to, to produce something that is not just the text and the cadence of the words on the page, but uh, this extra bit that, ten I mean, like it tended to be formal, like quite formal at least in terms of concrete poetry. 
But um, I always wanted, and I'm just like asking since this is uh, something that you were presented today, I always wanted these very silly ASCII drawings to be included in the category of concrete poetry. So um, I'm just making a plea for the inclusion of uh, ASCII drawings on the, uh, on, on, on the category, just for, um, yeah. It's not up to me. Um, you can ha yeah, you can have that. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, depends on the ASCII drawing, because maybe sometimes it's just a drawing and not a concrete poem. I quite lo like what Harry said about writing being a collaborative process, actually, because, um, yeah, just for my own personal satisfaction, um, that's what I find kind of exciting, but also what is at risk with this, like, s l like let's say, trend, for want of a better word, in the kind of first-person narrative or the, you know, the subject of voice um, that is kind of coming across a lot of the younger artists, poets that I'm encountering. <laughs> Um, and I think that, yeah, this idea of like that the that, that the individual, you know, is is it's plural actually, and that writing is collaborative, um, is something that is really interesting. And I guess that's you know, the way I think about that is much more of a kind of like how how wh wh how is the collective form now, and you're you're thinking about it in this kind of like as yeah. a writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walking is collaborative. But should we collaborate with the audience in terms of questions as well? I just feel very bad because in the first round there was only two questions and there's a lot of people. I don't know, it's not up to me. Okay. Okay, I'm happy, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Harry, for... <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I have more questions. I'm happy to open up, but uh, Sam, maybe... Yeah, all right, no. <coughs> I just, when, when I heard you talking, I, I found it very interesting. I'm not sure I understood everything about uh, your analysis on first person, and um, but but I found it very interesting. And um, it struck me also. It's maybe not exactly th the subject, but uh, we've had so many the last years, so many videos everywhere in every biennale. Uh, the same kind of pattern. This new model of video with uh, either video or uh, computer-generated images and that first person text, whether it's directly the artist or generally a mixture of, um, of an artist and um, of course uh, something bigger and uh, that goes further. I mean, Cecil B. Evans uh, last year here, uh, Ed Atkins and so on. It's always kind of same voice and it has really become a format. And, and in, in a way it joins also the, the idea of, uh, yeah, sorry. It joins also the idea of uh, of uh, form versus uh, content because you look at the images once you've seen one uh, of those videos you s you you have the impression you've seen them all and you start looking at the images and you you stop listening to what they actually say. Um, did, did you observe that? I'm not the only one. Or? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that yes. I think you know um, that style. Uh, I need to, I should be very, yeah, that th that's the problem. It's like, I love, like, Penny Goring, who both Harry and I both mentioned, you know, I absolutely adore her work. You know, she's, we've published her, we'll probably, you know, do some more stuff with her this year, hopefully, you know. Um, there is, you know, this idea of the first person, there's nothing wrong with that. It's what you do with that. It's like, it's like whether you do that in a way to expand a conversation with other people and to actually try and like have a conversation that isn't like rarefied and um, you know um, in in a certain language that excludes whether you know if it's done to open up something then great but actually you know there are examples um, where that you know where it's used and it just pre it presents this like air of authority you know, and it's like, that's kind of what I was thinking, what I think about speaking right now, you know, it's I don't have, you know, I, when I did an art BA, realized I didn't, couldn't, didn't and didn't want to be and couldn't be an artist and like halfway through was like, ooh, and kind of just started my own space. So I have no like legitimate 
um, reason for you know being able to speak about this this stuff and and actually yeah that that's okay but as long as you do it like with with that knowledge and with wanting to speak to other people and not in this kind of way where it's like this is my opinion and therefore it's it's authority and you know and everybody else should somehow like listen to it like people don't have to listen to me you know like i don't have to listen to ed atkins videos i really don't you know so um and like because because you um because you i wanted to yeah, I wanted to read the quote because the last one, um, and I think this is, I think it's just important. It's not just about, it's not just about language. It's not just about the internet. It's about like how we are, how we've been individualized. So like the idea of the individual is something that has come, yeah, post-war and is, and is developed, 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 developed. And now is something that, w that is being reclaimed uh, as a politics. And how do we allow that to be a politics that we can, Co collectivize with whilst not flattening others, whilst not kind of, yeah, being an authority. Um, and so the Jackie Wang quote, I'll read it. Um, so it says that, mm, and maybe it's the wrong quote. Du -du 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 -du. Sorry. Oh, uh, well, it's a different quote. Mm. No, yeah. So the, the politics of inno innocence and the politics of safety and comfort are related in that both strategies reinforce passivity. Comfort and innocence produce each other when people base their demand for comfort on the innocence of their location or subject position. And so Jackie Wang's text basically talks about how in um, certain struggles, um, your that the the, the the kind of movement is only allowed to have a struggle when there is kind of one figurehead that can, you know, so uh, she uses the example of Trayvon Martin and it's like, okay, so now we can have a struggle because he was innocent, you know, not, so it's so it's about the individual's innocence as, be, as legitimizing uh, a reason to call something out, whereas actually it should be the system in its entirety that's called out. So, you know, actually, it's the whole structure that allows things like that to happen that's being called out, not the fact that one person was innocent and another person wasn't. And that is kind of like how the idea of like this, you know, the individual is both kind of, yeah, a product of post-Fordism and post-war and all of these things, but it's also being used in terms of left politics as well. Um, so, yeah, I kind of was going off on a bit of a tangent away from the kind of writing thing, but I do think that they're related, you know, like, I do think that this that social media encourages this kind of both the good side of let's have a voice and also the bad side as well. So I hope that helps. I think we can open the discussion to the audience with two microphones, Adrian Piper. <laughs> Maybe you want to <laughs> she kind of <laughs> Hello, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a really interesting contrast between all three of your presentations and what Gilles did in his presentation. Uh, it seemed to me that his presentation was a very personal one. It was his voice. The texts were a mix of impersonal content and personal and autobiographical content. Whereas in the case of all three of, of your presentations, you were raising alternatives to that. Uh, Gomringa in the sense of collaborative writing and also formal and impersonal writing. And in both Roja's and Julieta's uh, presentations, you're raising objections to the way in which individualism and individuality can work in conditioning of voice. And you're suggesting that, as you say, the system is, is really should be the target of, of our concerns. But, but now, see, see, my worry is that, yes, there's some standard objections to what is called liberal individualism, but there, there are also huge objections historically to collective action and collective decision making. And in some cases, there are quantitative results that indicate the co collective decision making is in fact impossible. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering how, how you handle those sorts of objections and criticisms and whether your alternatives 
provide answers to those criticisms. Yeah, can I go first? Um, yeah, I think basically you're right, and I think that's kind of the end of my talk. That's was trying to say that's where I'm at now um, because it's it's still a question. Um, and Hannah Black, who I mentioned, um, a lot of her work um, builds on the reading she's done of Frank Wilderson and actually the, 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 this problem of, of kind of like um, solidarity as actually kind of marginalizing and not necessarily getting anything done. And you know, there's, you know, um, and so, and Hannah was sp speaking a lot about kind of like the problem of analogy and so the problem of kind of saying something is like something else, you know? And so how do we, how do we collectivize whilst not doing that, whilst not making analogy, whilst not saying that, you know, we're all the same and we've all had the same experiences and that, yeah, you, you're right. And that's something I don't have an answer to, but it's something that I'm thinking about more and more and more because what excited me when I started Arcadia Mister in 2011, 2012, was that actually the individual voice or a different type of writing was being published instantly, and that was extremely exciting. And now we're at a point like, okay, that's that's accepted to a degree in certain spaces, but let's not forget where it's not. And also then, okay, what do we do now that it has been incorporated more and more and more into a kind of, yeah, a more dominant culture? that you know isn't necessarily the best one so yeah it's still it's quite i don't know this was uh, actually uh, quite part of the conversations that we have when we started uh, super community because of the name to begin with yeah it's like okay so we are naming something like super community really uh yeah what do we mean and um i mean like it i think that we are trying to talk uh, to think in terms of um, um, dependencies, I guess, like the fact that there is no such thing as the isolated decision-making process, but that there are relationships on, of dependence between me and Andreas, and between me and you, and between me and the world somehow, that need to be taken into account, and that are uh, fraught with conflict, and that do not result in consensus, and that they are also fragile, and the relationship that I have with the w this aspect of the world today will change tomorrow. So, um, <coughs> um, and uh, there are re repercussions and echoes and so on. So, I mean, like something that I mean, it's very funny because we talked a lot about that, and one of the ways to solve it was uh, when we designed the, the, the shape of the billboard that we had plopped in Venice, um, we did not want to have a, a rectangle. We wanted to have what was like a group of, let's say, several different rectangles or shapes sort of like forced together into this precarious equilibrium that ideally will not become um, and like that, what I mean that that principle is uh, uh, that hopefully we'll remember that what works today will not work tomorrow, and so that there is no, you know, the community of today will not be the community of tomorrow, and what, yeah, like we are not trying to build consensus, but maybe address things that are larger than ourselves, if that makes any sense. Um, <coughs> just quickly, I just say that um, maybe problematically, but optimistically, myself as a reader, I like poetry as a site because I think it, it it's often an in, it's often a mechanism, a, a place where this exact question and kind of struggle is 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 fought in this very intimate way um, that y you you as a individual or the writer as an individual is, is coming up against this mechanism of for example print publishing which is very much like the collective mass and, and, and there's or whatever type of big publishing um, ap apparatus you know it's 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 those things come together and often the poetry comes in the slippages and the problems and I don't know I mean yeah that but th that yeah so that can for me that's quite exhilarating as a reader uh, but also I feel like a lot of that happens in the work I was talking about, but you just have to like 
read the work, and then that's kind of how that comes out. Thank you. I think that uh, Carson Chen, one of this morning's panelists, has a question. Yeah, um, so thank you for the presentations. Um, I guess it's it's on, right? It's it's a question for um, Juliet, and I guess um, Harry can chime in as well. But um, I was struck by your kind of characterization of how you, you started EFLUX as a way of finding um, another kind of um, access to ideas that you, you didn't have um, a, a, a kind of venue for in your art practice, uh, unless I'm misinterpreting you. And it struck me because uh, this morning in, in my talk, I was talking about how um, Gideon was writing um, about um, you know, his, the, the condition he was living in, um, analyzing it, and finding a kind of obstruction at some point, and just having to show a picture of art, um, and finding a kind of um, access in that uh, where the force of um, the linear narrative that he was spinning out through words just stopped, right? Um, can you describe a little bit the freedom that you find in words that you can't find in art? And Harry as well. Uh, okay. The, I mean, I'm going to make two distinctions there. Yeah, one is uh, there is there is efflux and there is efflux journal. Um, however, both of them were started uh, um, when Anton and I ran into the limits of uh, of this kind of like solitary figure of the artist and what does that mean and what does that what does that do for us and what it doesn't do. So um, efflux, I mean, like, which started as this experiment in circulation, then became the projects uh, of which have we have done many that are kind of like artworks, but, but are larger than artworks and are, are archives, but are not archives. And we do not need to claim authorship, so we do not have this uh, overbearing responsibility for them. And, and uh, so that's one side, and <coughs> which of course, and I, I mean, like it's a. Uh, it's intimately related to my to my work as a solo artist. Yeah, I do not, I cannot uh, separate them uh, at this point. I, I stopped trying a long time ago. Um, what happened uh, with the with the Flux Journal? It's uh, it was uh, something in terms of like how ideas come into my work. Uh, this is a personal thing, um, and I it allows uh, both of us, I think, the possibility of not being the passive uh, receivers of theory as it comes to us, but to actually encourage its generation and be like, okay, so there is this uh, subject matter right now that is incredibly topical. I mean, like, I don't know, like, uh, uh, not to talk so much about myself, I'll uh, mention uh, Anton. Uh, he got uh, totally, like, bitten by the bug of cosmism, yeah? So he's been using the journal uh, more frequently than I would like him to know, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, um, as a way to explore a lot of text that was untranslated from the Russian and to do a kind of like exploration that otherwise he would just be sitting somewhere waiting till that happens. Yeah, And I have done the same myself a number of times. So th that's what I meant, you know, like the, the kind of a position that it gives us. Uh, it's, it's really uh, something I, I, I appreciate and, and I'm quite uh, grateful to have. Yeah. Um, I I think it t it's to me that is it is interesting, in that I have to use words to stay alive, and I don't have to use art. And like that, I I, I think there's like problems in making that division, but I think there's also like, like la language is like, I don't know, that that is, I don't know whether it's a freedom or not, but I, th I think someone who's interested in, in both, there's that draw, draws like a specificity to words and changes the idea of audience in, in, in a lot of cases. Thank you. I think it connects to what has been discussed before in relation to the notion of community and uh, addresses Julietta's and uh, Roja's presentation more uh, foremost. 
And uh, while you were talking about the conceptual persona of super community and speaking in the I perspective, which I liked a lot, uh, I uh, thought of uh, Grace Jones' Corporate Cannibal from 2008, the album Hurricane, that starts like, welcome on my plate, I'm the man-eating machine. And uh, it's an amazing kind of um, uh, video clip and it's an amazing kind of uh, piece of, of, of sonic substance. And I was wondering in relation to that, that the conflation of the consumer and the producer, that is very much kind of a corpus in the ca uh, corporate uh, cannibal, also could relate to the super community uh, with regard to what is happening in the moment when the super community becomes apparent while eating itself up constantly. I mean, in terms of uh, a digital metabolism that uh, leads towards extinction. I mean, if we take this kind of uh, corporate cannibalism as something that eats itself all the time, because also what you said, like it did exist already long before we could think of. So it's a kind of a deep time community that pops up and then maybe disappears again. So I guess my question with regard to that is, if we keep this kind of corporate capitalism, corporate cannibalism in mind, uh, where do you sit here at the social contract in this kind of formation of community if it kind of switches between the human and the non-human and geopolitical, you describe it beautifully, like traveling all the time and so on, but I think this also is a question for the uh, printing publishing. But also, um, I would really like to understand how you would uh, consider the organizational formation uh, how does the organizational formation change in the moment when uh, the super community kind of uh, operates? Or, I mean, in which way do we have to rethink the organizational forms in a moment when we just uh, vanish and are eaten up by the super community? Um, Thank you. The, you know, it's very funny because when we when we were writing the, the the editorial text, we were actually we kept going back to a song and just like laughing a lot. Um, which was sympathy for the devil, and it was all like, please allow me to introduce myself, kind of thing. So that's there's, it, there is a, a, a sound <laughs> base. Uh, um, <coughs> um, and sorry. <coughs> um, um, the thing is, like, I don't. S I, I guess we don't see the super community as this inherently um, capitalist construct. Yeah, it's. Uh, it can be framed as such just because those are the, the easier framing tools that we have available right now. But I think that if it becomes framed as such, then you are only looking at one, at one facet of it. Um, I would like to think that the super community also includes plankton and uh, acacia trees. And uh, that poor, very skinny polar bear that was uh, floating in an iceberg a few months ago. Yeah? That's, uh, I think that there is uh, a kind of, uh, a, like a number of actors that are not uh, 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 writers or articulate enough or part of a capitalist construct that enter this uh, kind of very leaky construct, very, very leaky, very unstable construct. I think that the moment that, as I was saying, like uh, the moment that I would try to define it, it would explode in my face. And uh, as I do not want anything exploding in my face, I, I try to keep from um, too tight definitions of something. It uh, it becomes I mean like because th those I find those things prescriptive, and I would start hating myself if I would you I mean like I think already the word community is too loaded to give it more borders than than that. If uh, that I mean I used to say okay. In the moment that I am uh, using the word community to describe this particular endeavor, it means that this assemblage of uh, things, people, and ideas are working together for this particular thing. And I don't want to, um, and maybe this is something that has to do with my, this preservation of my sanity, yeah? Because I never think in long term. I never think, okay, what, it, what is this going to become? What, it is that, what is this thing that I'm doing? Because then I will get very scared. So I, I can only think in very short term um, uh, frames, I guess. Um, so do you, do you want me to speak about community? 
<laughs> um, I don't know. I, I sorry. I got. I've forgotten your question because I was listening. I, I don't know. I think it's. I understand what you mean about wanting to resist defining it, and I completely agree that community is also a really loaded word. But because I'm quite practical and I more just do th things, I'm not like a, a thinker or an artist. Um, I just do stuff. Um, I I do think you know it's it's like it's still like the Eflux super community, you know, it's still like in Venice Biennale and you know, you like there are there there it is it's still a specific community. I don't know how how much it can incorporate other actors, you know, it's it's like there is a specific audience and, and like that's not in your control, obviously, you know, it's like how how do you make things happen and what and where how can you do stuff? But I I I think that's that's yeah, maybe why um i don't know like maybe why we regressed into print somehow because actually it it is so difficult to to try and 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 do something um that looks t to have a broader community but that is in within an art context which is obviously like already loaded and problematic and already targeted as specific people um and so like with the with the print publications what i found quite funny and i think this is with a lot of independent publishers that you see like more and more like art groups doing like small print runs and zines and stuff is that like actually print media's dying out in loads of other like i don't know professions or whatever and that that the the, the dominant the dominant kind of uh, media is the internet and so that they and so I think that I feel, feel like that we've done this opposite thing where we're trying to like regress into like a smaller community, but then at the same time probably have the same confusions and concerns and conflictions because then of course you're like, you know, you're being extremely like introverted and niche. And again, there's this idea of exclusion, you know, with that introversion. Um, so I guess it's kind of difficult w what to do, but it's, yeah, I just was a bit, I just kind of, yeah, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. Um, the word community, yeah, it's, 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 it's a tough word. I mean, no, just, just to say that, the, I mean, the, it's, I mean, like that's, that was some kind of like agreement, the community, the, the, to call it super community, because um, with Anton, we basically have a, a, a system of agreement, which is the person that can scream the loudest wins. No, I'm, I'm really kidding, this is not true. Um, no, but at some point, I mean, like, it's not really, like, we have to convince each other of things. There's no, there's no, there's no such thing uh, as consensus in the, in the way in which we build things. And <coughs> if we, I guess, like, the, the, that informs very much the, um, the, the idea of community that we have uh, in mind, I guess. Because if we cannot convince each other, and we, we being a community of two people working together for almost 15 years, then thinking about uh, and this this is a question that has been asked uh, a number of times that do you think about the people that receive the thing that you do is like if I have to think about 30,000 people reading uh, what I do I would not get out of bed I, I have to kind of like block out entirely this uh, the idea of, of needing or wanting to please um, uh, uh, this I mean and, but at the same time, keeping, I mean, like, but that, that's not entirely true either, right? Like, they, I mean, it's, they, they are there, of course, and like this kind of thing that, um, that becomes larger than you is, is still there. And I just, I really wish I could just make little, like, fan scenes, like, go, like have a big, like, a large photocopy machine, and, <laughs> and yeah, that's. Uh, Maybe I just can specify, but there might be more questions. Hi. Hey. Um, yeah, I was what you were saying, uh, Julieta, about the this uh, new about this community idea, and for me. I don't know if you had it in mind of how it will then be embedded in as a social media and for example this whole idea of Facebook comments and threads and um, rants 
and this sort of this space where it's encouraged to do the I monologue rant or exchange and how if how do you think it is how the sort of the the form I, I wouldn't call it the literary form of a comment or a thread how it affects our way of thinking from you know because then it encourages it to be more like per first person rather than um, like theoretical uh, like analytical but then is there is there then a gradient from like um, Uh, online comments in articles, Facebook, all the way up to the actual Eflux journal and the actual academia, or is it, do, do you see it embedded in that whole thing? Very much, actually, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, I, I do have, a, I spend a lot more time in Facebook and in social media than I, w I would like to admit, actually. And a lot of the, uh, I've had fantastic conversations in comment boxes and comment threads with people I have never met in real life. And a number of writers that are part of super community come from that kind of... Uh, I know mo like Mohammed is super active. Like, there's some people who are just insanely active on Yeah, Facebook. yeah, yeah. He's, he's, one of my, he's one of the examples. And actually he was running the super conversation responses to super community just to keep that kind of thing going um, as a kind of... Uh, Because I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the, what happens in comment threads. But do you believe in productive conversation? You believe in productive conversations and sort of within that I've environment. Had them. You have them, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, just. Do at you least see it related to that personal turn as well of how, of this idea that it's like uh, okay, we're, you know, is there like a f bubble of yes sayers and no sayers in the sense that. No, I've, like I've, I've, I've yeah. gotten into like heated fights and arguments and disagreements that then become agreements and conciliatory and unconciliatory things uh, with people again that I have some I have met and I would we would never talk like that to each other in real life. It provides a buffer zone for s a lot of uh, things to be said. Do you consider archiving those kind of exchanges? They mm -hmm. are archived. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they are, because uh, because now it's this uh, this this moment when people are like, oh, are you going to make a book of this? And the conversation is like, well, we actually want to have those those thre those threads as part of the publication. I don't want to differentiate the so much, and to make another thing that all of a sudden becomes too much of an ivory tower. Yeah, like that's. Uh, so yeah, that's. Um. What communities, Juliana, are you part of that? What communities are you part of that are not the su super community? Or like what other communities are you part of apart from the, communi the super community? Does that make sense? Um, I mean, artists that make the same kind of work that I do, people that love cats insanely <laughs> and then post, post cat videos without shame. Um, Mexican artists um, that tend to be uh, geographically placed against our will. Um, I mean, like that's like a number of like subsets. And <coughs> no, I think these are like subsets. It's like if you think of like Venn, like uh, Venn diagrams. Yeah, like the, the, these things intersect. And I do not think that super community would be an all-encompassing definition for uh, things. It's super boring. Is the super community just the efflux community? No, actually it brings a lot of, uh, the idea uh, in a sense is to try to break out of the people that have been uh, using and liking and default uh, accepting and agreeing with these things. It's, uh, um, it, it's actually a lot of people that I don't even know who they are, I would like to think. Maybe one last question. The audience. Okay. <laughs> You're allowed to your second question. I think it really connects to that what um, Adrian Piper also was saying earlier on. I just think the social and political responsibility, where do you situate it in these kind of structures and frameworks you are building up? I mean, do you conceive it more as a facilitator? I mean, the super community, it's not like a very present example, but also I would like to know more about what you 
been working on this infrastructure as a facilitator, as a detector of that what already does exist but needs to be amplified, uh, or as a litmus test for kind of uh, uh, contemporary uh, condition, also politically and socially. I just really, where do you situate yourself in this kind of organizational uh, um, uh, frameworks? I mean, uh, wh what is it? What, that, what does it do? What do you want the super community to do to the world? Or what you are working on? Does this make sense or is it too... Um, I, think, I guess Thank I you. think that's why I was asking you about how, you know, kind of from a practical sense, like how can super community like incorporate plankton and stuff because, you know, it's actually, you know, an extension of efflux, it's at the Biennale, blah, blah, blah. And I, I guess I was asking that because, you know, I have the same questions on a much smaller scale, which is this like how, you know, how does something that was a space and a publisher that started from me just like coming, you know, out of art school and just being like, oh, I want to do a thing. And now it's almost five years. And with that, you are like suddenly, when you were doing something that you thought was institu institutional critique, you're suddenly being accepted into the institution, you know? And it's like, how, how do you negotiate that? And like, what is your responsibility? And I guess I was asking you that because it is something that is like, should always, should, should be considered. Um, and like, there's nothing wrong necessarily with institutions, like what is an institution, all of these, these are like a whole set of other, other questions, but you know, it's kind of like what I, what I want to do practically and kind of where I might make compromises um, in terms of like how much I do participate in the institution or whatever, is that ultimately all I want is to be able to like, you know, it's selfish, I'm practical, it's like I, want to be able to give platforms and have conversations with the people I'm interested in, you know, that's in I extremely selfish, but, you know, that's, that's, that's the way that I can run it. And that's, and I guess that's the privilege that I have, you know, it's like, if, if we wanted, if I wanted to be able to make a proper living of fuck Adia Missa, then I would have to work with like, more commercially viable artists or something and actually do you know what I mean like I'd have to have loads of like white uh, abstract like male painters you know and I don't want to you know so it's like there are there are these negotiations and 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 like yeah so um it is something I'm having to consider more and that's why I was asking you and actually like the main consideration is to try and have autonomy in the program and not have to put something on just because you think that it's trendy or that it's going to sustain you um, and and like that's yeah it's it's really difficult I mean we should probably have a drink and talk about it because I couldn't <laughs> you know like I could go on uh, yeah of course uh, yeah just reflecting on that and what Coletta just said I, I see similarities between the two of you but I think super community seems to have more political aspirations right and in that sense, it can't just be for yourself, because you said before, I wish planktons would be part of the super community, which I think is a great idea. But how do you reach out to planktons? And <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? Like with this agenda, it's, yeah, thanks. I mean, this is a, a, a and I, I fully agree with you. I mean, like there is like so much negotiation that goes into this thing that I, I try to make it go in automatic because if not, I would be an alcoholic, I think, uh, or something. <laughs> um, the, um, <coughs> I mean, like that, like something that is true of uh, of super community is that um, it does have a big political agenda. Uh, it's an that tends to be inescapable in in the, in the work that at least in the collaborative work that I'm involved in. Um, they, I there are strong political positions and it's kind of le left leaning and that's uh, and that's all very true and quite uh, self evident i would say um, when i need to escape uh, uh, direct frontal politics i go to my own work and i give myself lots of licenses to not address things on the face um, which keeps my sanity again that's a, that's a good thing um, but <coughs> i mean i think that um, uh, that said, I think with super community, we do have um, a lot more space, at least at the moment, and may that stay for a long time, to explore things without the obligation to always refer them 
to a kind of political alignment, to explore things for the sake of form or for the sake of language or for the sake of their intrinsic beauty or, um, or because I happen to like plankton very much, for example, I think it's um, something. Um, um, I mean, <coughs> the, the, like, I mean, I, I guess it's something about trying to, to consider things not only within the ratified universe of art world, but relationships of dependency, where maybe the, where, where, where I am, I mean, as, as ratified as this world is, it still echoes with the, uh, the rest of things that uh, we come in contact with, like the, the input from, th from the world, yeah? Like how to make sure that we do not close ourselves being, us, us, uh, us being uh, a kind of like internet platform, how to make sure that we do not close ourselves to things that are not just byproducts, byproducts of technology, but how to make sure that we can, I don't know, like keep uh, some kind of uh, level field between what we get from this and what we get from uh, an ecological crisis and the conflict in Syria and whatever is happening in my home country, yeah? Like, like that, that it all, and, and plankton. Uh, like how can it all enter? Not super community necessarily, but the, the at least the, the strands of thought that go into the making of such a project. 